This is Interverse Podcast. My name is Chance, and today you're listening to Season 3, Episode 1. I decided to go with Season 3 on this episode because it's Episode 50 of the show. I know if you go back and look at the track list, you won't see 50 tracks because some of them are actually behind my Patreon, some of the early episodes, but technically this is the 50th episode of my podcast. It also perfectly represents what I like to do on this show because I'm talking to an epic visionary artist, Crystallize, about the nature of consciousness, reality, creativity, and music festivals, a lot of my favorite stuff. So if you want to get straight to my conversation with her, then you should just skip ahead till you hear a female voice and you'll be there. But if you will hang on for a minute, I've got a few things I want to talk to you about, and most of all... I want to play a few songs by my own eyes. That's the background music you'll be hearing and in between segments of this intro. My own eyes is a musical talent that I just discovered thanks to my friend Johan. He knows all the good people that make music in this town and somehow I hadn't checked out my own eyes yet. Glad I have. I think you'll like it too. So look up that and everything I talk about, including links to Crystallize's website on the full description you can find by looking at whatever it is you're using to listen to this podcast and checking out the description. Let's turn it up. the last episode of season two with you're a soul which i highly recommend you go listen to if you didn't you'll know about eureka it's a social media with heart it's a website that combines many of the popular features of mainstream social media platforms into a place where you're not going to be censored and where there's basically no bullying or violent speech whatsoever because it's a community of people who are there for the purpose of expressing through the heart and with love and sharing information so It's a wonderful place, and with that, I'd like to invite you guys to come make a profile on there. And if you do so, you'll be eligible to enter a contest where, or sweepstakes, I guess you'd call it. Contest sounds kind of like a conflict, you know what I mean? And there's not really anything other than random luck to winning the contest here, so I'll call it a sweepstakes, which also sounds weird because it's like a lottery. But anyway, um, the sweepstakes to gain entry Uh, All you have to do is make a profile and make a post tagging me, Interverse, and there you go. You've got it. You're entered to the contest. And what that lets you get is potentially a big box of art. I will have links to pictures of my artwork that I'm going to be including in the prize package. There will also be a Eureka t-shirt donated. I'm going to be throwing in a bunch of crystals into this uh, package as well and maybe some other goodies. So it's kind of a mystery box, but you kind of know what's going to be in there, which is cool shit. And I promise it won't be cursed or in any way give you some kind of bad voodoo. I don't even know how to do bad voodoo. So I love you guys. I hope to see you on Eureka. That's Eureka.org with a U, U R E K A dot org. And there will be links to that in the full episode description. If you click on that on however you're looking at the podcast, you can see the prizes, you can see the contest page. And yeah, that should also let you figure out how to make a profile. I mean, you've made profiles before, right? You guys know how to do social media. Yeah, cool. You'll love Eureka, highly customizable, got all the features that you want in social media, and nobody's a jerk. Hooray!
thing that I like to do on Interverse, maybe more than anything, is get into deep conversations about metaphysics and the occult. A lot of people are trained to think that the word occult itself actually means evil or bad and some, something like that. What it actually means is hidden. And so occult information is just knowledge that is generally hidden from people. And truth, the truth about how reality works and all the various laws of nature, has existed for as long as the universe has existed. Now, whether mankind has been in touch with the truth or not, that's varied from time to time throughout the years. But I guess the problem with um, me trying to explain occult information to a lot of people is that, or just talk about it on the show, is that people don't have the same background of research or understanding that I have. They all have different levels of it. They have, they've heard things I haven't heard, they've read things I haven't read. And anyway, I think it'd be cool if we could get on the same page about some foundational concepts that I think are actually worth being, um, I guess, being applied in one's reality. And that would be the hermetic principles. That's what I'm going to be starting with today. And I'm just going to touch on each one of these seven principles of reality that's been passed on in many occulted uh, wisdom traditions for centuries and thousands of years. It's pretty simple stuff. You'll be uh, maybe... If you're not really someone that studies the occult, you might be surprised at just how straightforward and simple these concepts are and how not really religious it sounds at all and just sounds more like a science. And if you like this uh, type of thing, then check out the episode description for a link to the Kybalion, which is information that this is being brought to you from, the Hermetic Principles. It's a book from supposedly from Hermes himself, who was, I guess, a guy a long time ago that figured out a lot of shit. Well, but seriously, I only say that because there's so much to Hermes that it would be hard to even uh, briefly summarize that here. So maybe that'll be another time. But like I said, if you like this, check out the link and you can check out the audiobook, which is how I actually listened to this. It was a lot easier than trying to read it because I didn't have time, but I was able to listen to it while I was doing other things. And if you're listening to this, then you can listen to an audiobook too. You'd probably be better off listening to an audiobook, I'll say. But I really appreciate that you do listen to me, so I want to try to bring information in a way that is useful, at least similarly to an audiobook. So with that, I'm now going to give you the seven hermetic principles, which basically the entire hermetic philosophy is based on. If you've ever heard anybody talk about hermetic philosophy, it's kind of related to what you call alchemy, which is trying to mine the gold out of one's own self and create the best version of their consciousness possible. So the laws that or principles that you want to know as a hermetic practitioner or an alchemist are one, the principle of mentalism. This is a big one. This is the idea that everything exists within mind. Everything is mind in a sense. The all is mind. And that means that mind is not created by matter. It means that matter is in the mind. And you can think of this as sort of like the principle of, or the uh, metaphor of Russian dolls. There are minds within minds within minds, larger and larger minds. And the Kybalion book that I link in here does go a lot more into logical arguments for why this principle is so. And I am not going to go into all the deep levels of the principle here. I am just going to be giving you the um, the principles themselves so you can get just the gist of what a good place to start would be if you're interested in learning occult information and the science there that exists of uh, the human psyche and spirituality that a lot of religions are actually just corruptions of or at least in some way connected to. So the second principle is the principle of correspondence. You may have heard this one said by hippies all the time which is as above, so below, or as within, so without. This principle is extremely important to be able to grasp that there are reflections in everything on a large and small scale. The macrocosm is like the microcosm. You can look at uh, pictures of you know, the known universe and the connections inside of it, and what you'll see is the universe actually kind of looks like a giant brain, like the same as what a um, brain scan can look like. I should link pictures of that, and I will. Another way of describing this principle would be that the universe is fractal and self-similar across scales. 
The third principle is the principle of vibration. This principle states that everything is in motion. Nothing is ever at rest, actually. Everything is in some way moving. And you can see that in the large scale and how planets are and uh, heavenly bodies are all moving around things, including our own sun is moving around something in our solar system. And you can see that on the uh, subatomic level, how everything is vibrating energy. If you accept string theory, which you don't have to accept string theory to still accept that matter is energy that is condensed to a slow vibration. So that th that's the third principle, the vibration principle. Four is the principle of polarity. This is a good one to really contemplate. What the principle of polarity says is not that there are opposite poles within things, but that that actually is not the case and that anything's perceived opposite is actually just the same thing on a different end of the spectrum. A way of explaining that would be there's no such thing as hot or cold. There's just hot or heat energy and the lack thereof heat energy. So you couldn't really point at a thermometer and say, this point is hot and that point is cold, except relative to one another, one is hotter and one is colder to the other. And that goes for everything. Light and darkness is another great example. You can't shine darkness into a light room and make it a dark room. You can just take the light out. And the same goes for love and hate. There's just love and the lack of love. There is no hate. The same goes for fear. Same thing. So <laughs> there's really no polarity. But that being said, there is gender, and that is the seventh principle. I know I skipped the sixth principle, and I'll backtrack, but I want to just go ahead and give the principle of gender since we're kind of talking about it already. Gender actually does exist and is in everything. There's a male and female side. I won't say that male and female means positive and negative, and in fact, a lot of um, the judgments that slow us down is trying to put everything in categories of positive and negative, and that is... Um, a misunderstanding of the principle of polarity, but the principle of gender does mean that there is a masculine and feminine side to everything, including every consciousness, including, and, and what that also can be is like, there's a shining and a, re a receptive side to things. There's a, an in and an out to things. I don't know how else to put that. Um, that that's one that you definitely want to check out this audio book to get even more explanation on. I'm still trying to find ways of putting that principle into my understanding where it's currently lacking, including internally. I feel it's important to be able to recognize gender in things because that's a big part of balance. The genders of things should be balanced for those things to harmoniously express, at least in my opinion. So, and also my personal experience. So uh, I, I try to look within and balance and harmonize the, the sides of myself, the left and right brain, as much as possible because it's a good way to get yourself out of uh, principle number six, the principle of cause and effect. Because if you're not your own cause, then you are just the effect of somebody or something else. Everything is cause and effect. That one's an easy one. I don't think I need to explain that. Things don't just happen without a cause. Cause is what makes things happen. Uh, so, I, like I said, don't need to explain that one. Check out the audiobook if you want more in-depth explanation of that because it is a, it's very worth your four hours or so, however long it takes to listen to. Way better job explaining and way more in-depth than what I could do here. I just wanted to get people pointed on the path to different types of information than what the mainstream is going to be pointing you towards. Just because something is coming from an old source does not mean that it is somehow useless or irrelevant to now. This Kabbalion is the most relevant thing I've read in possibly years or even my whole life, honestly. It, it's very scientific. You'll appreciate it. And um, yeah, thanks for hearing me out ranting about the occult. I love you guys.
think it's very good to set your intentions for things clearly and openly. So this episode, my intention is to expose you to the wonderful mind of Crystallize. Crystal is doing the great work of expressing the infinite divine through her work, through her paintings, and through her life. And I think you'll enjoy our conversation very much. It is my intention that it helps you connect to the creative spirit within yourself and the divine feminine that nurtures that spark of desire to create and and helps you see that connection to the the goddess which is basically if you're you know whatever whatever uh, you want to say the goddess is to me that's the generative principle the principle of reality that we generate anything out of and so it's also love and i hope very much that after listening to us talk about sacred geometry and the divine feminine and painting and music festivals you will be able to go forth and do something that is your personal expression of creativity that's the whole reason i do this show is to illuminate your own passion your own desire and so please do so and please let me know what you're up to um Talk to me on social media, eureka.org or minds.com is the best place to go for that. And also don't forget to check out Crystallize. Her website is going to be linked at the description here. It's uh, spelled kind of funky, so just check out the link. And though, you know, go look her up on Facebook, Instagram, all of the above. Buy a print from her. She deserves everybody to buy all the art because it should be everywhere in everybody's homes helping them bring in that beautiful divine goddess energy and source light to their life. Art is really so much more valuable than a price tag that could be put on it with stupid green pieces of paper. And um, the creations that she brings forth are definitely priceless. And it's a miracle that we live in the age where we can replicate these things in, ad infinitum, because like I said, her artwork should just be everywhere. If you got like a yoga studio, definitely it would be good for that. <laughs> or you're trying to set up like a, just like a visionary room in your house where you can just have some reflection and meditation. There's so many ways that art can help us connect to ourself and to our source. Also, don't forget the music you've been hearing is by My Own Eyes. Also going to be linked there in the episode description. He's doing fantastic stuff and a lot of real instruments and instrumentalism going on too. So I love that especially the non-genre commitment <laughs> fuck genres so yeah check out the links for everything in the episode description and the one thing i'd really love it if you checked out besides my uh, musical talent here and the amazing crystallize would be patreon.com forward slash interverse if you click that link it'll take you to a place where you can donate some of your monetary energy to this podcast which will allow me to do a much better job overall because I'll be able to invest that money back into equipment, into prizes to give you guys like artwork and stickers and fun stuff. And also just free me up to have more time to work on the show and do as good, a, as great a job as I possibly can. I am going to be stepping up my, uh, I guess, production quality, you could call it, with this season three that we're doing here. I'm going to definitely be working more to to bring my own studies and um, things into play and help you guys get information here that you wouldn't be able to get elsewhere to make it, you know, actually helpful and worthwhile to listen to the show, hopefully. And I'd love feedback on that, on what you think would be cool to explore on the podcast or guests that you think would be great to have on, even if that's you. So please drop me a line at interverse.podcast at gmail.com. And like I said, it would be uh, awesome if you went to Patreon as well and supported the podcast. That would literally be changing my life if you could donate even just a dollar. Every little dollar adds up to that much closer to being free of a regular nine to five job and still being able to support my family in the way that currently I have to do it. Although I am also seeking as many ways as I can to change my behavior and my habits and what I see as a necessity in order to reduce my impact on the world, reduce my dependency on external things, and increase my connection to the source, the source of all creation, whatever that is, the thing that cannot be named or ever really defined. I think we all get a lot closer to that the more that we are able to rely on ourselves. 
and on people that we love and care about and are connected to in a real way. So thanks for listening to the show. And I appreciate you going through my entire long introduction. I'll take you to our episode with Crystallize now. Thank you for listening. I love you. Keep sharing truth with everybody all the time by living it and being it. Or just do what you want. And that's the same thing. (laughs) As long as you're not mean, I guess. I love you guys. Be good. And here we go. Open your heart chakras and send a whole lot of love and welcoming energy to Crystallize, the visionary artist painter who you very likely seen on the music festival circuit or online with her super amazing magical works. Hello. Hi. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me today, Chance. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and uh, the Interverse podcast here. Thank you so much. For me, it's always a big opportunity as a fan of artists like yourself to even get to have a conversation. So uh, it's really me who's super grateful to you. But uh, having a back and forth gratitude is how really good things are generated, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Keeps the universe flowing for sure. (laughs) So we were talking a little bit about getting some gardening going and how you were planting some fruit trees. and seems to be a popular thing for me to bring up on the show lately, but it's just so um, valuable and rewarding and natural, I guess, to start trying to and successfully gathering and growing your own food. Mm, Absolutely. And it's a a big dream of mine for uh, future gardens. I'm here helping my family at the moment and have a, with the blessing of receiving about 15 trees today, there is an Arbor, it's Arbor Day. And so we um, have our small orchard starting <laughs> here and deepening the roots with family and uh, growing, our, growing our roots stronger together here. So it sounds like you're in a really cool phase of life. <laughs> yes, it's certainly a dynamic one. Um, been a lot of transitions in my life over the last several years, but you know, trusting my heart and the guidance to um, actually right now being able to spend this time at home with family and such an important part of life itself is um, is our roots, our foundation with family. So um, I think I could agree. <laughs> really, with family, both your birth family and the family that you choose for yourself later in life if you do um i find that those relationships are what tend to be most impactful on your state of consciousness like they're closer to your orbit so to speak if they're planets and you're the sun of your own solar system and (laughs) so they have a stronger effect of gravity on you and so the more harmonious that reflection can be with with the parents and with the significant other the more you can generate and the more it seems like your energy is increased Mm -hmm. i completely agree with you and it's a beautiful analogy um it it is amazing to see our family as all these fractals of ourselves and what accurate reflections that we can get from them um I mean, sometimes it doesn't feel as accurate, but I feel like our family is an amazing mirror to gaze into and to really see ourself clearly and uh, many facets of that from different program behaviors that we were raised with um, to the spirit of creativity that we share. Um, the bonds of sisters, you know, I, I come from a family of four girls, so I've learned a lot about uh, really in the divine feminine coming from such a strong uh, basis of the sisterhood in my family. And um, 
Yeah. That, that really shows in your art, the extreme uh, potential of the divine feminine. What comes through in your work when I look at it is just the, I guess the uh, concept of the generative principle of the universe itself, which is, uh, that is like a way of describing the divine feminine. It's the will to life and the creative imaginative impulse that creates a vibratory pattern in what would otherwise be the void. I guess mm. the, the masculine energy has a component of will and acting as well, but that, that potentiality and that yearning to turn it into something else, that is a more feminine aspect, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with you. And you know, both are intrinsic to the essence of creation. Um, they, they inform each other. I see the creative capacity being the, like the fertile womb of consciousness and masculine being like the ray of light that's birthing out into the world uh, with a, with a directness or a focus of it. Um, and so the two are in this constant dance of dreaming and actualization um, that manifests what we perceive as the entire world. And so I, you know, I, I love to think about both of these energies, the feminine and masculine, but I don't like to um, look at it in a way that's, that separates the two because I believe that they're actually two primal forces of creation itself that's embedded into everything. Yeah. It's actually a lot of the trouble that we, pers we get up to in this uh, particular dimension seems to come from a forced separation between the masculine and the feminine. That's a lot, a lot of how, a lot of ways that we generate in our current type of society involves that, whether it's from like combustion engines or, um, like the way batteries work with two polar ends and really they're the uh the true reality is that it's hard to see where one ends and the other begins they kind of blur together to make this tapestry that we experience mm -hmm. yeah polarity gets a bad rap you know but it's actually the the impetus that creates life it's the in-breath and the out-breath um, like you said, it's the balance between the poles that is creating this electromagnetic frequency that we are uh, exuding and a part of. And so, you know, polarity, it is an aspect of creation that gives life its dynamic quality. You know, without it, everything would just be in this infinite sea of oneness and nothing would actually exist. So... <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's kind of making me think of this quote that you've put on here on your website through the alchemy of the creative process, the nature of my soul and the universe is revealed to me upon my canvas. That mm -hmm. I think is a perfect, a perfect explanation of why I think creating is so worthwhile that it actually gives you a direct picture of who you are in the moment of creation and whether you're able to manifest what you're trying to imagine through your will and your skill or whether there's some sort of distortion in the outcome, but that ends up being in itself a, a beautiful embellishment that you wouldn't have expected. Like mm -hmm. all of the little facets of the process are extremely, uh, ex extremely beneficial to your consciousness evolution. And it wasn't in, whenever I was not in a state of being frequently creative, I think that was when I was most depressed of any time in my life, like my early 20s, when I just had this strong desire to make something, do something valuable. And uh, because I was so in the thought patterns and thought traps of what our society teaches us, I didn't choose my way out of that until I had a certain amount of um, su suffering from from the imbalance that one undergoes whenever they're not, that is a reflection of the fact that they're not able to be creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think creativity is one of our greatest tools for transformation, um, both of ourself and the world before anything exists. It's preceded by an idea or a thought form and creativity is it's really our way of expressing 
the divine essence that's within us and bringing that out into the world. And it can take so many different forms. You know, for myself, I love painting, but I see creativity being an all encompassing way of life. Um, the creative act that it, it's it preludes everything and so the more that we can be in touch with our creative power within the more that we can really steward our reality in the direction that we wish to see and for myself um i believe that painting has been one of the greatest mirrors of my consciousness and my my evolution and it's um it's just an amazing way to get in touch with some of the deeper subconscious aspects of of ourselves and not only that but to tap into the potential of the infinite amount of inspiration of the collective consciousness and so you know and honing our creative process and also surrendering to it um so that we can allow room for that information to, or inspiration to flood in, we are uh, able to unlock aspects of our consciousness that we may have n not known even exist. And so, you know, I feel like my, my paintings, my artwork is constantly this conversation that I'm having with both myself and the collective that's telling me a story about myself <laughs> and, and it's a, uh, always surprising and uh, informing a new way of seeing and experiencing the world. I think that that's uh, exactly what you just said at the end is what kept resonating in my mind while you're speaking, which is that if we want to have a different world than what we have now, we have to be able to imagine it first. And uh -huh. <laughs> whatever blessings Absolutely. that you individually have that you can use to imagine through, and it almost doesn't even matter what you are doing with that imaginatory power, but just sh sharpening it and honing it in one way or another will give you more of the ability to use it any other place in your life, I guess. And mm -hmm. really we've been stuck in some negative behavior patterns as a, as a group anyway, a lot to do with group think instead of tapping into the true self and the higher self spirit that we're all capable of tapping into and sharpening the imagination through whatever disciplines we can, that's going to be a surefire way to, you know, change, change dimensions, reality hop, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the, the transformation aspect that you talked, you touched on, I think transformational festivals have been a really helpful way for many people to start being able to exercise their imagination again, whenever it had been previously sort of killed or deadened. For me, that's the case anyway. That's actually what led me into wanting to do art myself. Uh, I do markers mostly actually, but I've been playing around with acrylics and that's a lot of fun too. But just yeah. podcasting itself, like you were describing as having a direct reflection of yourself to yourself in a chronological story almost. That's how podcasting really is too. Like if I were to go back and listen to old episodes, which I don't think I would really do, <laughs> I would probably go, wow, who is that even talking? What, what <laughs> Like where are those thoughts coming from? Those aren't me. Those are just words. And it's not that I, um, you know, I don't stand behind the things I say because I work I work hard to be in a balanced state so that I can align my thoughts and feelings and actions and words uh, as one and in line with the true will of the higher self. But it's still strange because uh, conversations themselves are almost like a type of channeling where you're, um, where you're channeling is the combined essence of the two people who are directly reflecting towards one another. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I feel that that is also what's happening in the transformational festival setting, um, in particular through the process of live painting and live art. Uh, there's this energetic field that's created that is being harnessed by the artists that are working there. And so while it 
is coming through the form of maybe one artist's hands, there's actually a whole collective field of energy that's breathing into the paintings and artwork that's being created in that moment. And that's a huge part of why I've found uh, live painting and the transformational festival setting to be a really incredible place to like open up portals of potential and um, to see what's possible when we come together in a group resonance and are all sharing um, sharing this experience of this collaboratory, uh, energetic, vibratory state of being. Um, and I feel that I've been very blessed actually to witness through the lens of transformational festivals, uh, a very clear window into the evolution of consciousness. And that for me has happened through an involvement in festivals for many years. I've been doing festivals for over a decade as a live performance painter. And I actually started out live painting before I had ever seen anyone live painting. I started out live painting in Wisconsin about over 12 years ago. And at the time, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just knew it was something that I was being guided into. And slowly over time, I started to uh, both meet and watch other live artists that came into my awareness and to see it sort of start sprouting into the festival setting. So I can remember at certain festivals, you know, a long time ago that there was only a handful of live painters there. And now you can go to some of these festivals and live painters are everywhere. And it's been a full cultural shift from, you know, these events that were more, you know, festivals that were music oriented and party oriented and into a whole different um, spectrum of a multifaceted experience that really does touch upon, you know, this, um, this collaborative aspect of the creative spirit, you know, all working in unison to create a, a holistic experience for people. Um, and that, you know, reaches out into many other things beyond just the live painting, live, um, live dance performances and the workshop settings. And so it's been really cool to watch, to watch this, you know, festival scene evolve as we're all evolving and to see it sort of as this, um, you know, microcosm of the evolution that is happening in humanity as a whole. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, microcosm. I actually have many times thought that, the fractal nature of the universe is very well demonstrated in the microcosm of the music festival. In a way, it's like you come into a new incarnation whenever you come into a music festival, like starting a new life <laughs> would be, but it's just shorter. And in life, in life, you come in with a certain group of people or some people kind of come in alone. And that's the case with the music festival. In life, there's a lot of things that you could go do um, and a certain, and they're kind of t time to happen at certain times and you could go, or you could go do something else. You could do be free the festival. You it's the same thing. There's a lot of music that you could see or you could not. Um, and you run into people that maybe you've seen in past festivals and you somehow feel like you, or you often will recognize people on a spiritual level at these transformational festivals and not even have met them in the past, but know that mm -hmm. you somehow have a connection. Right. So, mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, there's a there's that kind of fractal scale, uh, you know, demonstrated in a lot of places in the world. I think the music festival microcosm is it's really even become even in the most party oriented places uh, a situation where if you go in with the right intentions, you can come out with a huge evolution of consciousness, and that's true for everywhere. But because there's such high energy, uh, I guess fields of people coming together, then the potential for you to come out with a lot higher energy is, is all there. But then again, you could also go in with bad intentions and wind up somehow taking like sketchy substances and having a really bad time with 
mean people, I guess, but that's never happened to me. I think you get the vibe that you put out at those type of places. Uh, it's a, mm-hmm. it's really good stuff. Absolutely. Are you going to yeah, any this so, year coming up? I'm, I'm curious. I am. Um, I'm gearing up for, I'll be at electric forest this year again. Uh, I've done electric forest for the past many years now and have a beautiful, uh, space that we're creating in the heart of the forest. It's called reincarnation village. Um, a beautiful team of people that has created a amazing, they're actually permanent structures in the forest and beautiful nature mandalas. And I'll be live painting with some of my best friends there. I'm doing a, a um, I worked last year on a large collaboration with Morgan Mandala and Randall Roberts. I love and that. yes, they're, they're amazing. So we're going to have a good crew out there this year. And it'll be my first festival that I'm going to uh, that's lasting now two weekends in a row. So <laughs> yeah, they just expanded you know. that. So Electric Force is up in Michigan. That's I've up been in there Michigan. a couple of times and I had wonderful times both times I went. It uh, it's not been something I've been able to go back to since 2016, but I definitely look forward to the day I can return that, that space is just pure magical. There's nothing really like walking around the forest at night. If I'll definitely be linking some electric force pictures in the episode notes, cause I want you guys to see how there's just these trees lined up in rows because it used to be a, uh, what would you, what do you call it? An orchard, right? And mm. So there's everything's a, all lined up and then there's lasers shooting through the trees and all kinds of amazing structures. And yeah, well, how would you describe it? <laughs> oh, it's just, it's an incredibly magical place. And, you know, the story behind the forest, um, I, I hope I get this, this right, but basically the, the gentleman that owns the land, the forest actually wasn't there. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, if the, it was a... It was just an open space, but he decided that he was going to plant a bunch of trees. And so they went and they planted them all in these rows. And he you know, he says that it's amazing that this forest started with just planting seeds. And it's grown into this incredible, incredible, it's undescribable experience to be in this forest, especially during electric forest. I've had the opportunity to be there both before and after the festival. So it's amazing to feel the way that the energy changes of, with all of the beautiful p- beings that arrive there and uh, fill the, the forest with art installations and just really beautiful energy. Um, and it, it's a magical place. <laughs> it really is. So if you're a festival goer and you've ever heard people screaming about Carl, where's Carl? That came from Electric <laughs> Forest also. Uh, yeah, that was so, from the very first one. <laughs> it was before it was Electric Forest, it was uh, Rothbury. And I was actually at the first Rothbury. I, I can't remember how many years ago it was, maybe eight years ago. I think um, that sounds close to right. Like 20, yeah. 2009, 2010. Mm-hmm. It was, let's see, 2008, I think was maybe the first year but I could be wrong Uh, yeah Um, I wasn't there (laughs) you know better than me but it's been cool to watch it evolve you know it's like even it's like what we were talking about here and the spirit of evolution and you know how it does move through these uh, music festivals and transformational festivals I you know I'm personally I've done more festivals in the past I'm kind of scaling back the amount of festivals I'm doing this year I'm only lined up for two festivals this summer, but, um, but it'll be great to get back out and connect with com- community. And I'm also doing Rootwire um, Music oh, Festival in Ohio. Beautiful. I hope to go to Rootwire. Of July. And that's just a incredibly beautiful festival as well. And I've been a part of that for a long time. And so it's going to be good to get back down to the heartland in Ohio, um, beautiful Athens. They've moved it, um, right? Uh, they did move it. Um, I was there last new, year, but now a it's a little location. further. It's a little further. Do you, I'm sorry if I got that wrong. If it's not, it's not no longer in Athens this year. <laughs> yeah, well, that's okay. We'll link to both of these festivals in the show notes. Either one would be really worthy of your time to go check out. If you have been curious about music festivals, but you weren't sure 
which one to go to. Um, Rootwire is definitely a heart centered transformational festival where it really is about trying to help people see and learn permaculture solutions for for their life, whether it's through, because they have a lot of workshops at Rootwire. That's part of what makes it um, a transformational the workshop, experience. Mm-hmm, the workshops are the heart of of what Rootwire is really bringing forth. They have an amazing workshop lineup, um, and the curator of their workshops is a woman named Julie North. I know who's been her. A good friend of mine for a long time, and she's an amazing woman and brings together just you know experts of all different kinds of fields from healing to permaculture art um yeah ceremony the ceremonial aspect of the festival as well and so i look forward yeah, they to set their intentions very powerfully at that festival and it helps uh, it helps to do that when everyone resonates with the uh, higher intent the true higher self intent it makes that much more powerful for each individual i think and mm-hmm. There's also fun acro yoga, I might add. Uh, I learned a lot of cool acro yoga stuff there from the Fractal Tribe teachers. Nice. Awesome. So um, what else could I say about Rootwire that makes it really amazing? I think with something like Electric Forest, while part of the magic is that it's so overwhelmingly big, with Rootwire, you'd get the advantage of uh, it's a smaller, more tight-knit type of festival. And to me, a lot of times I have a higher level of synchronicities occur whenever it's a somewhat smaller festival. Maybe it's it's because mm -hmm. the odds are better. Well, it really does give you an intimate container to get to know people. Um, They, they do electric forest and or have, completely different sort of feelings to them. And, um, as what you just said, you're actually reminding me of an incredible experience I had at Rootwire last year that, that I could share and kind of goes along with this whole theme that we're talking about. And so last year at the beginning of the festival, I had found this little white caterpillar on my clothing and, um, (laughs) and, A little later on, I was with uh, my partner and I look over and he had the white caterpillar on his Mm -hmm. shoulder. And so I thought that was really funny. It was like a a completely separate side of the festival grounds. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, we didn't kind of joke that the caterpillar had migrated. And so we take this little white caterpillar and I, um, I went to this nature altar that my friend Jarek Soulflower um, Carlson built and he had created this amazing uh, nest space with a beautiful flower altar flowers and crystal altar and I took this little caterpillar and I released it into sort of the, the entrance of this altar space <laughs> there's a little spiral there and um so I, I put the caterpillar in there and and then had my little prayers for the opening of the festival. Like you said, setting your intention with these experiences is very important and can really help to to create the container for the experience that we desire to have and what we're really calling to ourselves in terms of the manifestation and connection that we want to experience. Um, so... So anyways, the festival goes on and then the last day of the festival, I had my artwork set up in a gallery space throughout the weekend and I noticed that there was a beautiful moth that had landed in my section of my, near my paintings in the gallery. And a little later in the day, another moth appeared and so there's these two there are two imperial moths and by the end of the day realized there was three imperial moths that had gathered in my painting space and one had landed on one of my canvases that actually has this this butterfly moth that's emerging out of I call the painting chrysalis and it's all about transformation (laughs) and so I just thought it was uncanny you know that this moth that both landed right next to its, you know, its friend in my painting. Um, but also just the, the theme and the meaning behind the painting that um, it chose to land on and the thread of connection to this whole process, you know, even releasing the, 
the ma- the caterpillar into this altar at the beginning of the festival. And so it was a very, you know, amazing experience just seeing, having the, these moths gather there. Well, then as we, they, they stayed, this one stayed on my paintings for hours and went back and noticed later that it had started to lay eggs on the canvas. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, it was just this incredible nature blessing and, and it just, uh, just a phenomenal phenomenon. <laughs> I've had <laughs> seen plenty of, or I've, I've had and seen experiences with um, moths and butterflies and dragonflies at music festivals where it seems like there's some sort of higher consciousness coming through the insect. Actually, uh-huh. my friend Anthony, who I met at Envision Festival this year, he told this story a few episodes back whenever he was on the show, but I'll summarize it real quick. He had had to, uh, he had gone to the festival while his wife had stayed behind back in Canada. So all the way from in, uh, Costa Rica to Canada is how far she actually apparently traveled in a dream state because she told him that she had a dream that she was with them on Saturday night, him and his friends dancing around the main stage. And that night they had actually had the experience of this moth that kept landing on their clothing and stayed with them and their group for hours and hours, even while they were dancing crazily in the front of the main stage with really loud music. So <laughs> it's like the timelines matched up. Like so maybe there's somehow a, uh, like she was like beaming into that creature and sort of looking through its eyes for the night. It's pretty crazy. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's it is really it's it's profound the way that the the nature kingdom can communicate with us and um the heightened experience you know I've had a lot of really profound experiences that have happened for me in the container of a music festival which is surprising you know but these really unique visitations from the other one that sticks out in my mind is I was visited by an albino tarantula at tribal visions festival two years ago and this tarantula came and it was wow really profound to me actually because earlier in the in the afternoon i had found a little i had found this spider in my gallery space that i had set up i had a beautiful uh, mongolian yurt that i set up with a, a micro gallery of my artwork and anyways i like let the little spider out the side of the yurt and I kind of stopped in the process of this and was thinking why did I need to let the spider out you know is it was it out of fear I didn't want it to get stepped on but I was kind of just questioning that action while I was in the process of it and I looked up and I saw a guy that reminded me kind of of like he reminded me of a spider man (laughs) (laughs) it was really weird and then I know he had like a little like almost looked like a cobweb tattooed by the side of his eye. And he looked at me and he goes, was that a spider? And I'm like thinking, no way. <laughs> like, how, how does this guy know, you know? And he's like, I love spiders. So I'm just laughing inside at just the irony of this moment. And I said to him, I love spiders too. And, and then I said, and I was feeling the truth of that, you know? And I was like, I, and I realized that I still had this deeper rooted fear that's connected with spiders from my childhood. And I said to him, I, I feel though that I still have a healing that I need to do with a tarantula. And I spoke this out loud. And then sure enough, later that night, I have this white albino tarantula that walks in from the side of the yurt and comes over and it, and it came and it sat under my easel and it stayed there with me for almost 20, it stayed in the same place for almost 24 hours. And it, it, it kind of hid under my, where my paint was, my paint case and just hung out there with me. And, um, I had a very, very profound experience with the spider, you know, and so, you know, when we ask, you know, it's just amazing reflection of like asking for, 
you know, asking spirit for a certain healing or a medicine that we need. And the way that spirit hears us and responds, uh, it's uh, very profound to, to have, you know, that such a clear and instantaneous manifestation of yeah, the thoughts. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And it, I mean, it's it, believable, but it's amazing. It's, it's true. It's totally true. Um, but I think back on it and it almost seems like it was a dream, you know, and, but yet it just, to me, it really speaks to just how vastly interconnected that we are to life itself. And, um, and the more that we can recognize that and not project our fear onto things that seem separate from us, you know, the more that these experiences manifest in our lives and, um, you know, are these evolutionary catalysts as well for just seeing the immaculate interconnection of of life itself so i love it because you don't there's no there's no higher uh understanding that has to be a tied to it or no complicated wisdom that has to somehow be extracted from the experience it's just you were ready to heal that particular uh inner inner shadow i guess of uh uh an egoic self that was false because it's saying that you're afraid of uh, afraid of something when essentially everything is self and there's nothing to be feared at all. Exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah. as soon as you're ready, the I, I feel like the universe does work this way that as soon as you're ready to let go of something, release something, change something, you will have mystical alignment to provide that. And it's just a matter of how much you're paying attention to, to notice that it's there and available or not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I also love spiders. I have a spider tattoo. Um, <laughs> it's one of my only tattoos. I let my wife is reading my Spider-Man comics right now and it's really making me love for that much more. <laughs> <laughs> spiders are, are a very interesting type of being because they represent the, the principle of creation and, uh, itself because they they have to build for their livelihood in a way and the humans are very like that uh not very many other animals do have a sort of constructive component to their their environments some do i guess like beavers build dams and there's probably more examples than just that but one of, <laughs> i find that to be a, a really interesting component that and they uh they sort of the fact that they take care of pesty insects around around your space that can be useful. I actually got literally dozens of black widows living underneath my house and around my house, and they've never bothered anybody or anything in my house, and they just are just really cool, crazy looking spiders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more that I the more that I learn about spiders, the more fascinated that I am by them, and you know, even going into ancient culture and the, the symbolism of the spider, uh, the grandmother spider, we, the weaver, you know, is weaving these threads of connection between everything in the cosmos. And you know, the story of Indra's web, where in this immaculate web of consciousness, that each of the points of the web is like a jewel that's reflecting inside of that jewel, all of the other facets of the web of consciousness. And, you know, this is really how I view creation, um, especially through the lens of sacred geometry and that everything is part of this tapestry of interconnectedness, um, that every point is connected to every other point. And so I, I feel that the spider is a beautiful totem for that, that message. Um, and yes, they're divine, divine creatures weaving the dreams. The, uh, there's other mythological things that come to mind for me with the spider and the divine feminine in particular, the, um, the Roman goddess Athena had a myth regarding her and another being who was called Arachne. Arachne was 
I could be butchering this, but from what I remember, she was just like the best weaver of all time. And Athena was actually jealous of the fact that uh, she could weave better than her, a goddess. And so she turned her into a ugly spider and that was the <laughs> curse. And, and that's just, as far as I remember, that's like, that's the story. There's no like higher moral or anything. And it's kind of interesting. Athena seems to be more of a dark side type of goddess in that story, not the uh, loving, um, accepting divine feminine. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then the Roman culture was very left brain, masculine imbalanced in general, most likely. And that's why they probably would project those types of traits onto their deities. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's all, you know, all the qualities and characteristics. It's still all part of the divine, <laughs> divine feminine. You know, there's not just the sweet and... Uh, creative, you know, there's the the fiery and vengeful. I mean, it's, these are all aspects of consciousness or characteristics, you know, and uh, the way that, you know, I'm not as familiar with the Greek mythology, um, but yeah, there is just this pantheon of different qualities and characteristics of the human psyche, you know, and, um, I think that embracing the shadow side just as much as we embrace the light is really the the true path to healing and um, harmony of the self. Recognizing the principle that all is within each and each is within the all. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the same concept as the web of Indra that you were describing. Mm-hmm. Yep. I fully, it's, you know, one of my deepest beliefs, um, guiding philosophies for life. And I, I really look at that as well to go back to the, the theme of sacred geometry that I was talking about. I think that sacred geometry is an incredible way to, to have a tangible way to see how that's possible because you're able to break down, you know, the essence of what the fractal microcosm, the macrocosm of life, how it all fits together into this amazing, you know, wholeness. Um, and it's, it's like a source code that's behind it, the scenes. It absolutely is. It is, it is the source code. <laughs> that's why whenever you expand your range of perceptual ability through plant medicine catalysts, you're able to see how that source code actually is within everything and interconnects everything. I'm curious, by the way, did you start working with sacred geometry in your art from basically the beginning of your art career or career practice? Or was that something that you discovered as your, as you went on? Like, I know you came from a sort of a lineage of painters from reading your bio on your website and that your grandmothers were painters, if I'm Mm -hmm. correct. And so did they bring those type of higher truth principles into your awareness or did you discover that and start to expand on that on your own? Well, it was something that I did start to expand upon, I would say uh, on my own in terms of sacred geometry, um, coming from a family of create creative individuals. My grandmothers were both artists, but very different kinds of artists. So they gave me, um, they gave me both sides of both, you know, painting the natural world and, uh, landscapes. My grandma, one of my grandmothers was much more realistic and, my other grandmother was very much about found objects, um, you know, recycled art, collage, uh, more abstract expressions. And she was also an art therapist. And they were both hugely inspirational to myself um, as a child and throughout my whole life. Um, and then beyond that, my father is an architect. So he brought in an appreciation for structure and for um, the way that, you know, what I learned from him was how I'd see this blueprint that he'd be drawing in front of him. And then this blueprint would become a physical structure. And it really demonstrated to me from being from childhood, the power of our 
creativity to put an idea into form and actually manifest that in the world, <laughs> you know, and something that for my father was very tangible in the form of, uh, you know, a large building. And so all these pieces were part of sort of my early um, development as an artist. The way that I started to engage the sacred ge geometry aspect of my artwork really was a, uh, it rooted from an experience that I had and was connected to actually a lot of my questioning as a child and my own, um, you know, spiritual exploration, I would say. And so my early art, I'd say I've been an, I've been an artist since I was a little girl and I used to work more realistic in the beginning I was rendering and I actually thought that I might want to become more of like the photorealism kind of an artist. And I felt at that time, this is, um, let's see here, two th around 2004, 2005, um, I was feeling a bit stuck in my art because I felt like I was heavily reliant on looking at something that was in front of me. And so I decided that I wanted to open up this intuitive part of my creative process more. And I started a, a painting um, that was very, very organic, very abstract. And the whole painting theme was about the interconnection of life. And this is, you know, something that's coursing through my being since I was a child, you know, I'm really seeing and feeling how everything is connected. And so it was this painting of these organic forms uh, kind of undulating into each other. And I got to this one point where there's two beings that were simplified basically to the shape of a DNA strand. And there was the point that the two, these two beings were arising out of. And I looked at that point and I decided that I wanted to do something that was like going to draw attention to it. Cause I felt like it was the point of origin in my painting. Anyways, I decided that a circle would be a good kind of uh, shape to work off of. And so I grabbed a piece of paper and a compass and I started to draw circles on my, on the piece of paper in front of me. And before I knew it, I had this incredible pattern before my eyes that, you know, was just deeply intriguing and, and exciting to me to see. And as I looked at it longer, it was almost, um, it's hard for me to even put into words this feeling, but this un like undeniable feeling of familiarity that was emanating from it. And so anyways, I put this, this form into my painting. Well, I actually attempted to, I'd drawn it on a separate piece of paper. And when I tried to recreate it, I couldn't figure out how I'd drawn the pattern. <laughs> So it took me a little while and I thought that, you know, and I finally figured it out again, painted it into the painting. Well, I came to realize later on, this is um, I, the time after I had finished this painting that the form that I had painted actually had a name and it was called the flower of life. That is and amazing. <laughs> so, um, but it was driving me crazy for a while because I was like, how do I know this? Why do I know this? Like this is, and that, you know, there's this part of me that felt like I had, you know, initially uh, that I'd made it up, <laughs> but really I was just channeling something that was coming through me. And so there's a whole, you know, uh, surrender of, I would say the ego even into an attachment of something being original unto herself. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, nothing new under the sun, right? Right. And I mean, I was just blown away as I started to look into what the flower of life meant and to actually start to unlock the symbolism in the flower of life. When this happened to me, I started, it was such a profound experience for me, especially finding, you know, discovering that this pattern had been discovered in temples and pyramids and, you know, places all over the world since the beginning of recorded history. And so that experience in my conscious path was one of the greatest testaments to the presence of a collective consciousness and to this divine um, 
just this divine blueprint that exists within the heart of everything. And as I deepened my work with sacred geometry and started to see the different patterns that are contained within the, the matrix of the flower of life, I was just, I mean, I'm still continuously amazed at what, I discover within it and the way that I can, you know, I began to look into nature in a completely different way and started to see these threads of connection between everything that I hadn't perceived before I had this language of sacred geometry to, to look at the world through. Um, and so that's been, you know, fundamental to both my creative artistic development as well as my spiritual development. Um, I would recommend to anybody that has not tried this to actually go ahead and get a compass or some kind of circular stencil and go ahead and try to draw the flower of life pattern. And you, I would, I would recommend trying to intuit the way to draw it. Look at a picture of it if you need to. And if you're not familiar with it and intuit the way to draw it, but there's also many, instructions on how to do it out there and i actually remember the first time that i drew the flower of life too and although it was not that kind of a mystical experience and that i, I was actually i had looked up how to do it i was just doing it because i'd been reading about the significance of sacred geometry in ancient cultures and how how it works as a vibratory blueprint in that it's a two-dimensional pattern that generates a three-dimensional uh, result, I guess, not unlike how DNA works. And uh, it was just extremely, extremely psychedelic is the best word I could describe it as whenever I was drawing <laughs> the first time I drew the pattern and, and, you know, while trying to imagine and conceive of how this pattern is the generative principle of reality. And it's, um, it's it's hard to it's really hard to even put that into words i guess <laughs> i just i would love everyone to give that a shot it's a really cool exercise yeah i i highly recommend it as probably one of the greatest gifts that you could give yourself it's um you know it's one thing to learn and read about sacred geometry to to draw and create it yourself is a whole nother way of accessing the information that's contained within these sacred forms. And it's a, it can be a very simple exercise, but what you can draw out of it will last with you for a lifetime. Um, it's a very, very, you know, I, I agree with you, incredibly psychedelic experience to look into the, the, the like I, what you call the vibratory field of sacred geometry of the flower of life and to like I would explain the first time I started to really unlock it I was looking at it and it became like a magic eye where all of a sudden you start to see these different shapes and basic the most basic shapes you know the the triangle the hexagon they're all embedded within this pattern and in such a simple and profound way that it's it's almost mind-boggling you know um and that's and, an interesting aspect of it too is those shapes emerge whenever you give whenever you add straight lines between the points you can start to generate those shapes and so it's like the circles are the feminine foundation and the straight lines are what you apply on top to generate the to manifest the desired you know, shape, I guess, or vibratory frequency that shapes themselves archetypically represent. Totally. And so you had to go break back to our initial conversation of the divine feminine and masculine, you know, the flower of life is like this infinite field of potential that's breathing and embedded within the structure of space of, it is, I believe, the structure of consciousness. Um, or it's field. It's more of a field and the structure comes through with the masculine um, connection points, which is connecting the dots between the points of the flower of life. And the two um, breathe in and out of each other and manifest all of the shapes and little structure that we perceive in our visible physical reality. Um, but also 
you know, underlying and the quantum field of potential of things. And, you know, so it's not just in the, the visible realm. This is in very much in the non-visible as well. Um, having a, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, just um, taking up the study of and uh, and dedicating yourself to the understanding of archetypical symbols is very useful to understanding your world and having uh, access to the building blocks of creation for whatever things you want to use them for. Mm-hmm. It's like these, and it, just working with with uh, archetypical symbols, you'll tend to have infer meaning and create generate things out of out of that creation like just drawing sacred geometry and doing a metatron's cube for example that will demonstrate to you how uh different ways of looking at the same thing give you all the different shapes that are possible Mm -hmm, exactly so like reality is all these different perceptions but it's actually all generated from one thing it's a it's a microcosm of the macrocosm mm-hmm. absolutely and hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's amazing and you know it's all when you look at number and shape they're all related to aspects both of of like you're saying of ourself and of the universe and so they're like the universal principles and that ties to evolution, you know, from the point of oneness splitting into the polarity of the two. And then you add in a third circle and you get this Trinity, which is, you know, also called the tri unity, um, where all points are in perfect balance. And so there's this like push and pull of our consciousness. We're like, you know, in tune with, all of life and then we sometimes move out and we feel separate and then we come back into unity and um the dance that dance of awareness you know is the center point represent, is your heart, right the center point is your heart it's your soul it's everything um you know it's everything and nothing actually <laughs> <laughs> Um, it seems like whenever you get too far into any form of negative behavior, negative feelings or negative thoughts, it's always returning to the heart center that lets you rebalance those things. And so mm-hmm. that that's what a lot of ancient mystery traditions would have point to in the world or what have become our religions is that it's our thoughts, behaviors and actions that form the Trinity that have been exoterically referred to by people as a god, goddess, and a human. Or I guess in some traditions you would have uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. But I feel like that's sort of a rejection of the feminine, that particular triunity. So I like the I like the God, goddess, and, and human self aspect, or Father Sky, Mother Earth, and human self. Those, those type of mm-hmm. trinities. Um, are like balance balancing your trinity that's that's where it's at right <laughs> right and you know and part of that balance too we could see one triangle let's if we we're still talking of the triangle um the triangle pointing down could be feminine and then you flip it and the triangle pointing up is uh, male so as above so below and the center point is that divine harmony the heart um of creation and these two shapes together create what's called the star tetrahedron. And this is a energetic field that basically surrounding all of life. Um, it's a, basically a toroid, toroidal field. And um, so, you know, these mirroring the balance that can be achieved through sacred geometry both reflected in the evolution of the shapes themselves and through the process of working with it um, really does demonstrate just how synchronized and um, just the the organic balance of life itself, that there is this natural equilibrium that's embedded into 
life and consciousness. Equilibrium is the last word. It's mm-hmm. that, that's the thing that we, that's why we find ourselves in suffering in general is that loss of equilibrium. So mm-hmm. that's, that's the best message to take away from here, guys. Balance your male and female sides and jump up to the, the tri-unity position of a balanced consciousness where you'll be able to generate anything that you imagine and you will be able to imagine anything. Is there anything that you would like to uh, say before we jump Uh-oh. off the call here, Crystal? We're actually about at our, our time mark. So I want to give you the opportunity to promote anything, um, give your website and stuff like that. Social mm. media that you want people to talk to you on. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been wonderful to share this dynamic conversation with you and about all my favorite stuff. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, and thank you to everyone who's tuned in with this podcast. I hope that this was uh, inspirational in all the ways that you're seeking right now in your soul's journey. And um, if you'd like to connect with my artwork, um, and I also do teach about sacred geometry on my website. And so you can go to my, my page, which was, is um, www.crystallize.com. And that's spelled K-R-Y-S-T-L-E-Y-E-Z.com. Um, and as well, I have a Facebook page, uh, Visionary Art of Crystallize. And I'm on Instagram. I use that actually a little bit more these days. So... Um, so yes, please keep in touch and ever, anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me and, um, thank you again so much for the opportunity to share and, you know, ripple out some of this divine inspiration to the world. So appreciate what you're doing with your podcast and illuminating, um, you know, and focusing on the power of creativity and uh, evolution evolutionary consciousness um, to you know bring good healing to the world so i'm just grateful that there are individuals like yourself that i can bring to this platform so that and you know because inspiration is definitely the, that's where our soul is at the what inspires you to act in the world that is your soul so uh yeah i hope you guys are feeling really inspired i definitely am this has been a great conversation We'll definitely do this again as, uh, in a few months or, or something like that. We'll, we'll get in touch again. Maybe I'll even see a root wire. And uh, maybe yeah. I'll see some of you guys a root wire. <laughs> All right. Love y'all. Great. Well, thank you, you so much. Week. Many blessings. That's all for this week, folks. So remember to check the episode description for links to crystallize all of her work, find her on social media, and also look up my own eyes for the music of this episode. And you can go to patreon.com forward slash interverse to support this podcast. Again, thanks for listening. Keep loving life. See you next week.